Most people get their water from one of two places. City water is usually taken from surface water resources, treated, and piped to your tap. But if you live in an unincorporated area, you might be getting your water from a smaller on-site well. This water is from underground aquifers, also called groundwater. So what is groundwater? It's water that collects or flows beneath the Earth's surface, filling the porous spaces in soil, sediment, and rocks. When we say something is porous, that means it has small spaces or holes in it, through which liquid can move. Porosity is an indication of how much water a material can hold. When we say something is permeable, that means it allows liquids to pass through it. Permeability is an indication of how easily water can move through a material. Materials like gravel and sand are permeable and porous. Water flows through them easily and they can hold a lot of it. Materials like clay and shale are porous and can hold water, but their pores are so small that water flows through them very slowly, giving them low permeability. With this in mind, let's talk about aquifers. An aquifer is a saturated area of sediment or rock that groundwater can move through. Groundwater stored in aquifers can be brought to the surface using wells. So you can imagine if you think about something like the Grand Canyon and you can see all those different layers, well, some of those layers hold water better than other layers. And so they're all sandwiched together and interconnected in um, various different ways. And because it's all underground, it's hard to know about how exactly they're interconnected, but they're stacked on top of each other. Uh, so when you drill a hole in the ground, you drill through some geologic formations that aren't holding any water, and then you can drill down into one that is. We use wells, uh, groundwater wells, for all kinds of purposes. So the typical shallow wells here um, in the vicinity would be down at about maybe 200 feet deep from the ground surface, but they're pumping water from 60 or 70 feet, and they're pumping it from a water table or unconfined aquifer largely. So a confined aquifer, if you then, if you go back to imagining the stacks of different rock types, um, if you think of it like a sandwich, like if it's a BLT and it's a slanted BLT, then if the tomatoes are the water holding ge geographic feature, then the water flows down through the tomatoes. But if the bread is impermeable to water, the bread is then confining the aquifer in the tomatoes. And so because it's on a slope, water keeps pushing in and pushing in. And so there's pressure on the water from the top of the hill to the bottom of the hill. And then the cool thing about a confined aquifer is if you drill down through the bread into the tomatoes, you can get water to come up under pressure. And an unconfined aquifer is just one where, where uh, it has it has contact with the surface, and so there's nothing holding it in place. Water that collects underground is held in an upper unsaturated zone and a lower saturated zone. The unsaturated zone is located directly beneath the land surface, and the pore spaces hold both air and water. In the saturated zone, all the open spaces are filled with water. The water table is the very top of the saturated zone and the bottom of the unsaturated zone. Well, the saturated zone would be all of that soil or whatever the lithology is at depth that's below that surface water level, or we call it the free water surface, that you would intersect when you drilled the hole, say, and you dropped a float in and you'd see this water standing, or like standing water. So it's all of the soils or lithology below that free water surface is considered saturated. There's a zone above that called the capillary fringe, or has some other names, or seepage face, that's also saturated but held there by capillarity. So like a capillary tube sucks water, like a straw, a thin straw, out of a beaker, the capillary fringe holds water in the saturated, it saturates the soil there, or nearly saturates it. Above it, the soil begins to desaturate, associated with the capillary pressures in the water, in the soil water. 
until when you come near the surface, it's relatively dry if we're away from you know, wet areas. Water table is just sort of the common word that people use to refer to aquifers, but it's a little bit confusing because it sort of implies that there's some sort of table underneath there, and it's just this giant lake underground. And because of the way rock formations are formed and interlayered, it's not really the way things are. And so I, while basically when people say water table, they're talking about the depth that you have to drill down to to hit water. What does it mean to recharge the water table? You can think recharge the groundwater table is basically put water into that aquifer. It's like a, imagine if you had a glass full of sand and you could pour water into that glass, even though it's full of sand, because there's all the little holes in between the sand bits. And so you could pour water in there, and then if you drill the hole in the bottom, water would just leak out the bottom. And so the more you pour water in the top, the more you're recharging the ground table or filling up that aquifer. I'm interested in that recharge area or that zone that we sometimes refer to as the Vado zone. So Vado is just meaning the unsaturated or partially saturated zone. And looking at agricultural recharge in particular, for example, irrigation of orchards or regular row crops or alfalfa hay crops, and seeing what fraction of that, you know, leaches the root zone or moves through the root zone and, you know, is beyond the crop demand and goes down to the deeper groundwater. How do surface water and groundwater interact? Some rivers and streams gain flow from groundwater, and others lose flow to groundwater. The streams flow across the surface over permeable, some permeable layers and some impermeable layers. And so you can, and also the streams themselves carry a lot of gravel and sand. And so they, they lay down a bed of permeable sediments. And so water can flow down through that ground, through that gravel and sand into the groundwater if it's an unconfined aquifer. But if it's a confined aquifer and there's, there's a clay layer like that piece of uh, bread on the sandwich that the water can't get through, then it doesn't flow down into the groundwater. And then also you can have losing and gaining reaches. And so some reaches of a stream are leaking water into the groundwater and some the groundwater is pushing up into the stream. How does this all relate to our own Santa Rosa Plain and Laguna wetlands? The wetlands are kind of complicated because um, you would think it's a giant puddle of water on the surface. Wouldn't that be a great way to recharge the groundwater table? But the fact that it's a giant puddle on the surface suggests that there's no connection to the groundwater because if it was connected to the groundwater, it would all drain and then it wouldn't be a wetland. <laughs> and so wetlands themselves are not great groundwater recharge features, but they do create sort of a dam and back water up above them. So water flows across the Santa Rosa Plain and then hits this feature, the Laguna, and that does trap water um, that people can then use as groundwater. Whether your water comes from city pipes or from a well, groundwater is a resource we all share. It is our responsibility to manage groundwater sustainably so that future generations will have access to safe, clean water. Thank you.